Good morning to everyone and it is a privilege and a blessing that we can all gather together even though we're separated by distance. Technology allows us to be gathered together as a church to hear God's word. Before we start, let's pray and seek the guidance of our Heavenly Father this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we give thanks first and foremost for the wonderful privilege you've given us to be your children. We who were strangers and lost and far, far away now have the wonderful <coughs> privilege of being brought close into your family, heirs with Jesus Christ. We give thanks that it was all possible because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. We who had no ability to come close or save ourselves have been brought close by your grace and love. We give thanks. We give thanks for the time you give us to open your word and to hear what you have to say to us. We pray this morning that you speak to our hearts according to our needs. We pray for all brothers and sisters worldwide, particularly those going through difficult times, challenging times, those persecuted. We ask that you give them a special measure of your Holy Spirit. We pray you be with us this morning and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to speak briefly about rewards and what we view as reward in life. And we all seek to be rewarded for what we do. Even the simple task of going to work involves a reward. We get paid an amount of money for our labor. That's our reward. At a more complex level, we want to be rewarded for living a good life. We believe we're entitled to something because of what we do. We want to be rewarded with good relationships. We believe that if we are good to our spouses, the reward will be that we will have a good relationship with our husband or wife. So reward is fundamental to the way we live. What is the reward for this earthly life, for my life, for your life? It's easy to say that our reward is in heaven and we look forward to that day when we will be in heaven and we will be rewarded. It's true, but how does that play out and how does that impact on the way we live today? And is our reward to be viewed as something different than just what's coming, but rather what is? That's the bit that I want to focus on this morning. And there's a character in the Bible that really speaks to this question of reward. And it's Abram who became Abraham. And his life is summarized in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, where we read, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We read in the book of Genesis that Abram, is called by God and God says, Abram, come out of the place where you're living and come to where I'm going to have you live. We don't hear anything from Abram. He just packs up and leaves and he takes Lot with him. We read that he goes into Egypt and he has issues with Sarah and Pharaoh. We read that in the, in, in, in the scriptures. He comes out of Egypt. He separates from Lot Lot picks the nice fertile ground and Abram goes his way because they were both, you know, had large families, livestock, etc. We read that Lot 
was captured in a war and Abram had men, uh, had army, had, had his own sort of private army, so to speak, fighting men, and they went and rescued Lot. And we read at this point in time that Abram was exceedingly rich and wealthy. And we come to chapter 15 of the book of Genesis, and I want to take our reading this morning from chapter 15 of Genesis, verses 1 through 6. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but the one that will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And when you read the rest of this chapter, we read about the covenant that was made the unilateral covenant between God and Abram where the animals were cut in half and separated and Abram sees the 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 pot with fire coming through this was a symbol of making a covenant and it was God making the unilateral covenant and promise to Abraham because of his faith it was accounted to him as righteousness this is the first time in the Bible that we see Abram speaking to God. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. After the things that had just happened, he'd had the promise, come out of your country. He'd gone through Egypt. He'd separated with Lot. He'd gone, gone and saved Lot in that armed battle. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Please focus on those words. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. It's also translated in some Bibles as your reward will be exceedingly great. But the way it's written here, it links God being Abram's shield and God himself being Abram's exceedingly great reward. It's very interesting to focus on those words that God was Abram's reward. Not all the things that he had not all the possessions, because by that stage he had a lot of possessions and God continued to bless him. His reward was also the promise that God gave him about what was to happen in the future, how his descendants would be like the stars in the heavens. But it also emphasizes that God himself was Abram's reward. And from that, we see Abram becoming Abraham. And we have the summary that we read in the book of Hebrews. There's rewards in this life. We went through them. The rewards of hard work, meaning you get labor, a reward in terms of money. The rewards of putting in effort into relationships mean the reward is a better relationship. 
any number of things we can use examples you work very hard at a particular sport you get rewarded Unfortunately, in life, it doesn't always go as planned. You can put a lot of effort in and something falls apart. Many people would have built businesses thinking that they would be successful. And yet, with this coronavirus, a lot of businesses have been decimated. The reward isn't always there. And Christians often emphasize reward as, I do, I act and Christ will reward me in heaven and we can fall into the trap of thinking that if I do a lot of things for Christ my reward will be great in heaven if I come here and I preach if I teach if I do all sorts of things in the church I will get rewarded in heaven and we're thinking and speaking of specific rewards we think we will have a higher place in heaven greater crowns more glory be that as it may, there's a difference between focusing on rewards and the reward, the only single reward that really matters. God was Abram's exceedingly great reward. Jesus Christ is our exceedingly great reward. We have this huge advantage over Abram. He went out, he was called by God, he went out, and he didn't know where he was going. Yet we're called and we're given a road map in the terms of, of Scripture. God has revealed so much more to us through his word, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's much clearer. And Christ... This is the emphasis this morning. Christ is my reward and Christ is your reward. Let's unpack that a little bit. What do we mean by Christ is our reward? A couple of passages that we can read that help us unpack this. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, we read, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up as together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We were dead in trespasses and sins, dead. And we've been made alive in Christ, and we've been placed to sit in the heavenlies. That's the first thing we need to understand there is no life outside Christ and the only life is in Christ with Christ indwelling in us. If we, we need to understand that that's the first and most fundamental reward. We're alive, spiritually alive, brought out among, from among the dead. And the privilege of being placed to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, we read, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Note that. We're children of God. We're in God's family. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together do we understand the magnitude of what's being said here that in terms of inheriting the kingdom of heaven we are treated as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're put on the same level as Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Again, this looks forward in terms of reward, but it's got nothing to do with doing and acting and, and, and achieving. It's what's been given to us by Jesus Christ. Coming back 
to earth, so to speak. We read in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's a mystery here that Paul's talking about, the mystery among the Gentiles. The mystery can be looked at in a number of ways. In one sense, the church, the gospel being preached to the Gentiles, is a mystery in the Old Testament. It wasn't understood, and yet the gospel has come to the Gentiles. The hope of Christ has come to the Gentiles. But there's something even deeper than that. The mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. We read the story of Abram, who became Abraham. And we said, we see, God came to him in a vision and spoke to him. Earlier, God came to him and said, come out of your country. Later on, he says to him, Take Isaac up to Mount Moriah. I have plans. I want to see if you're going to withhold your son from me. God came and spoke to him. In the Old Testament, we read God moving among the nation of Israel. For example, when Gideon was called to go out to to war in the book of Judges, we read that the the, 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 the Spirit clothed him, came on top of him like a cloak and covered him. And the Holy Spirit left. So Abram had periods where God spoke to him and periods of silence when God didn't speak to him. The mystery in the, among the Gentiles is that Christ now lives in us continually through the agency and the power of the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. Christ in you. Paul picks up that theme in Corinthians as well in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 15. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. Don't you know, Paul's saying to the church at Corinth, Jesus Christ is in you? God was Abram's exceedingly great reward. My reward and your reward, brother and sister, is not what we expect to get for what we do, even the good things and the things that we treat as sacred, what we do in the church and our activities as Christians for the furthering of the kingdom of heaven. Our reward is deeper and more fundamental than that. Jesus Christ is my reward. Jesus Christ is your reward. Let's try to understand how important and how mind-blowing this is when we start seeing as the reward of my life, this life that's passing so quickly that, you know, the Bible says we have three score and ten and then maybe if we're lucky we get to eighty. This life that's so fleeting where everybody seeks to profit and reward The real reward is Jesus Christ himself. How does that play out? Do we understand that when Paul says, Christ in you, is effectively the same thing as saying, Christ in you, and I'll explain Christ in more detail, Christ the Creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
and he made everything and nothing that was made was not it was made without him not being there he made everything in in chapter in verse 14 of that chapter and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory we're talking about the eternal we're talking about the creator of the universe we're talking about the one that became flesh and in Philippians, Paul says, the one who humbled himself took on the form of a bondservant. And then because of that has been glorified by the Father. We're talking about something that blows our mind when we think about it. The creator of the universe dwells in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is my reward. I have life. I'm not dead. I'm not spiritually dead anymore. I'm in communion with Jesus Christ himself. What greater reward can there be? And how important it then becomes to be in tune with Jesus Christ and his will in our lives. Our church, us as a church, we are the bride of Christ. Speaking in terms of relationship, the bride of Christ, this communion, this union, where we have glimpses of what the union means using that human analogy of the bride and the bridegroom. We are the bride of Christ, the church. Christ dwells within us as a church. What greater reward can there be than the eternal living in us? Everything is passing. Everything in this world is passing. And we live in an age where we see the challenges are mounting. The problems become more complex, more difficult. People are suffering, people are struggling. I was just commenting earlier how we're starting to see fragmentation in countries like the USA. Countries that were built on Christian principles, fragmenting. And we know that a nation will fall not so much from the forces from outside but from the moral decay within and we see the moral decay in this world we see a world going to end point very quickly we see everything passing and we read in 1 John where, where John talks about do not love the world or the things of the world and we focus on that and it's important to focus on understanding what the world is and not to, not to be trapped by the things of the world. But he gives us the reason why it's passing. It's falling apart. It's going. The time has come. And it's always been passing from the time that Jesus Christ died on the cross was resurrected and gave us the hope of new life. This order is passing away. Everything is passing. The only thing that remains, the only reward that you have is your life. And that life, if it's built on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Because everything else will pass. Everything else will fall. Everything else will be destroyed. There will be new heavens, new earth. We read that in the scripture. Only thing that remains, the only thing that remains is his word and the life built on the rock, Jesus Christ. Our reward is our life given to us which was lost, which was destined for damnation. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet, in Jesus Christ, we are able to build a life on that rock through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
That's the greatest reward. The greatest reward is being able to commune with the creator of the universe. To understand, as Paul said, to understand the width and depth and love of Jesus Christ. And for Paul, and it should be for all of us, the more we dwell into the person of Jesus Christ, the more glories that open up before us here and focused in eternity. Our reward is Jesus Christ. What does a life look like? A successful life. One that has the most absolute and perfect reward. It's a Christian life. And we can spend a lot of time talking about what it means to be a Christian. And often we do that. Let me simplify it. Let me simplify what it means to be a Christian, what it means to have the reward, the ultimate reward. The ultimate reward and the Christian life is me and you being transformed day by day into the image of Jesus Christ, being created like Jesus Christ. Not through our strength, not through our power, but through the indwelling and the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the ultimate reward. To know Jesus Christ, to know him in the magnitude and depth that's revealed day by day. To allow ourselves to live in his light and his glory to be made like him there is no greater reward may god bless his word in our hearts this morning let's finish our sermon with prayer heavenly father we give thanks for the promises you give us in your word we give thanks that Jesus Christ is our reward. We give thanks that Jesus Christ is everything. Help us day by day dwell more and more into the beauty of the person of Jesus Christ. Let our lives be transformed and become Christ-like day by day. Let us truly understand that our reward is here and now in the person of Jesus Christ. Not only here and now, but also in eternity where we are joint heirs with him in glory. We give thanks for the promises in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.